Mel and Bernard. Mel, obviously we've just seen from you, but there might be some more people who've just come in. Would you mind just uh, introducing yourselves and then hopefully Lazar will be sat next to you by the time we, uh, we get there. Uh, Mel Jiki. I uh, work in our CHRO office as the strategy director and I look after our HR teams globally at Unilever. Excellent. Welcome, Lasse. Bernard. Hi, I'm Bernard Ma, and I do three things. I help companies do AI and digital transformation in practice. I write about this for Forbes and for my own blog on LinkedIn and I, I teach and speak on that topic. Excellent. And Laszlo, welcome. I hope you're uh, feeling refreshed from your fun uh, car journey through, uh, through London. Please uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, I'm Laszlo Bach. I lead a company called Humu. Uh, I was with Google for about a decade, and uh, I'm freshly acquainted with London traffic. You guys, <laughs> you do not mess around. It's a wonderful <laughs> thing. It's wonderful. Well, welcome. Thank, Thank you, for, you for coming straight up so quickly. All right. So we're going to be talking about uh, the, the current state of AI and HR, what's the impact of AI on HR? And so, first of all, Mel, I'm going to start with you, if that's okay. And I'd love to get your view, just from a, an HR practitioner's perspective, around, you know, how, how do you feel that AI is starting to kind of creep into the HR agenda? Obviously, we heard from you presenting earlier. And is it all hype, uh, or is there reality in there? How are you kind of navigating through that? Yeah, sure. So we're, I think, a, a bit further advanced on the AI journey at Unilever in HR. So we started with the digital recruitment that you saw, but very much um, as we spend a lot of time looking at the world of work and what that's going to potentially be in the future, it means that we're really disrupting everything that we're doing. So we're implementing a chatbot at the moment called Una. Stella, who's in the audience, that's her job. So she's working hard to, to do that. We're really looking at how we're redoing performance and what would be the AI that sits behind that. We've um, implemented Degreed in learning, so doing a lot more personalized learning at the moment. You heard also how we're really looking at the next generation recruitment and looking at a tech stack there with a number of kind of AI um, back. So almost in, in every facet of HR, we're looking at AI. I think the trick is how you curate that and bring it all to, together because it's one AI for one problem. So I think the, the trick is how you create that unique employee experience. Yeah, excellent. And Bernard, when, in your book and a lot of the research that you do, it, you look at other industries as well and you look at the impact um, that AI is, is having across the board. When you think about the HR industry, the HR professionals, uh, what do you see here? Is it automation? Is it augmentation? Like, How do you think this is going to impact HR professionals themselves? I think it's a bit of both. Um, I, for, for me, the key is not this is, I, I usually work with a, a strategic leadership team in organizations to help them really identify where can they leverage technology and use AI. So the AI is not the driver, it's really identifying the challenges and then using technology wisely to do that. And what I feel in the HR field is that this field is lacking behind. This is why I wrote the, the book Data Driven HR because I, I, I think there's so much stuff going on which I wanted to highlight. Um, but I feel I, I don't see the, the strategic starting points necessarily. It's really refreshing to see and hear that you've done that. But I, I feel in lots of HR organizations, it starts with opportunities, there's technology there, and let's try to jump, jump on, onto the AI bandwagon instead of really doing this strategically and transforming the, the HR function. Yeah, okay. and do you feel like the HR function will find its way through this, that it has a place, or that some of this is going to be taken over by, by other parts of the organization? Yeah, so slightly controversially, one of my most successful blog posts was on that we don't basically need HR anymore, and had 3,500 comments, so as you can expect. <laughs> um, so one of the slightly controversial angles I take is that actually what we need to do is we need to separate out the more analytical HR function to the people-focused HR function. So what I, 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 from my experience of working with HR teams is that people come into this profession because they're actually passionate about people and helping people. And so I, I think there's this role of a people support function. There's really a caring role that creates the right experience for um, people in the organization make sure they're happy and progress well and can be themselves and then there's the analytical side where 
and what I feel is that the analytical side is, is more about capturing data, getting insights, helping the organization to, to navigate around. And I don't feel that these two functions blend very well. From my experience, lots of people that are working on the people side are not necessarily native in data science. They are not mathematical. And this is creating a conflict for me. And I think separating them out a little bit is a really useful idea. OK, interesting. So Laszlo, obviously very well known for doing a lot of pioneering work at, at Google around people analytics. When we think about this theme of, of data and people data and how we're now seeing an abundance of data starting to get creative with a lot of the different platforms that people are using, but do you feel like we have the right data to really be making HR decisions from, you know, to be powering some of these algorithms that the tools are based on? Is the data rich enough, do you think, um, for us to really be getting into people decisions and do we have enough data to be doing that? Uh, there's a tremendous amount of data. I think companies actually don't realize how much data they have often in their systems. I mean, you see everything people do. Um, companies are legally allowed, but I don't think ethically should read people's emails. Um, you have everybody's complete employment history on places like LinkedIn and your own applicant tracking system and so on. So there's there, the issue is not that there's a lot of data. The issue is that a lot of human dynamic, there's a couple confounding issues that make it hard. One is that a lot of human dynamic is very context dependent and that's not captured in any spreadsheets anywhere. Our body language, the way we're sitting right now, the way we're interacting, the fact that we're on a panel rather than sitting around a conference table, that changes how we interact. That's not captured in any data. The second thing that's not captured and why applying AI to the human sphere is, is harder than search, for example, uh, is that we actually inhabit different personas at different moments of our lives. We're different when we're with our kids, then we're with our spouse, then we're with our friends, then when we're out playing sports or watching a game. And we make different decisions in each of those moments. So there's plenty of data. Um, the trick is capturing what's important and making sure your systems are not biased when you're trying to draw conclusions from that data. And that's a non-trivial problem. Yeah, excellent. And I know, obviously, you're in stealth mode with Humu, so I'm going to ask yeah. the one question and you can go wherever you want with it. But how, how is some of this influencing uh, what you're exploring there as you've you know, gone from being leading the HR organization and now on the, on the vendor side? How are some of these kind of things that you've learned at Google influencing the work that you're doing there? Yeah, well, the, um, on the Humu side, the fundamental thing we're trying to do is figure out uh, and we've done this with about a 12 or 15 companies so far and, and kind of more on the way. Um, how to actually make the experience of work better for everybody, individual, manager, executive, and prove that that drives productivity, retention, and happiness, and uh, so far so good. Uh, what's been interesting being on this side of it is that um, in a lot of HR organizations, when you're sort of like now a startup trying to like sell to companies and create value, um, there's a lot of vaporware in the market, so tech companies kind of just make stuff up, and that's how you raise money, and you have to really pressure test to make that's true. Uh, number two, a lot of tech companies train and build their business around uh, other startups, because startups are very happy to use one another's products, and the reality is that use case doesn't generalize to the enterprise, so Unilever's needs are very different than, you know, random.com in Silicon Valley. Um, and most startups miss that. And then the third is, if you're a, a startup trying to build credibility and relationships with a large company, uh, I think it's important not just to have an HR sponsor, but a business sponsor as well, because it's not sufficient to just show up and have a business case. You actually need somebody in the organization who says, I run a business, I want to use this product as well. Excellent, excellent, thank you. So, Mel, as we think about all of the great work you're doing at Unilever, and as you said, like literally across all of HR now, you're starting to think about how to implement these uh, technologies. For folks in the audience that maybe are organizations where they're not quite so far down that, down that journey, um, kind of how have you kind of managed that internally with your internal stakeholders? Have there been times when you've maybe had blockers and you've had to get kind of buy-in? You know, and how have you managed to kind of keep the innovation moving along from that yeah. point of view? I think um, because we started on this journey back in 2015, at that time, I think AI was very new. It was very scary for a lot of um, business leaders. For some, it, it still is today. And there were a lot of blockers. There were a lot of people telling us, you're on the wrong path. You're not going to be able to do this, wanting to us to answer the next 10 questions, the next 10 questions before you could move forward. I think to Laszlo's point, what was the key for us is that we did have a business point, a sponsor and we had a HR sponsor. And both of them were very progressive in their thinking. 
and kind of, I guess, uh, ran um, air control while we in stealth mode did what we needed to do under. And then we could slowly but surely, I guess, uh, show people that this wasn't as scary, that there is really good science behind what we're doing. But again, to last those points on vaporware, I think there are a lot of shiny tools out there that you can get distracted by. The science is not always behind it. HR professionals don't always know the right questions to ask. So they see some fancy screenshots, which isn't even a product that's uh, fully developed at the moment, and kind of think, oh, that's great, let's go with that. And that leads to unintended consequences and then only reinforces what the business thought in the first place. So I think it's for HR professionals really absolutely having those great sponsors, but knowing and asking the kind of right questions. And we have a people analytics and data team that come with us and ask those questions. And we, you kind of need to make sure you have all the, the right people on the bus from the, from the get-go. And that's what helps, I think, with the various stakeholders in the business. And, and thinking end to end, what is that solution you're trying to create? Because it's often one technology, one problem, but the key is what's the end to end solution, think employee experience, and then often again from a stakeholder perspective, if you talk from that employee experience, it's often often much better and they kind of have that light bulb moment and, and think through. And then if you've got the data behind it, off you go. And where do you think, uh, has, has there been any differentiation between business stakeholders and then your senior kind of HR stakeholders in terms of getting adoption? Has one group been more enthusiastic than the other or have you found it's been kind of pretty similar? I think now the, the business is saying hurry up mm. and, and that's uh, what it is. I think uh, we, as a CPG company you think about how consumers are changing. They want what they want, when they want it and how they want it. Our employees are kind of no different. They're our consumers as well. So we need to um, kind of get the people experience in rapid pace as we are with our um, changing consumer experience. So the business is, is hot on the trail. I think HR gets it and we're, we're trying to, to catch up and, and deliver at speed. Excellent, thank you. And so one thing that often comes up around this theme of adoption and kind of getting traction is uh, ethics and privacy and data security and things like that. So Lazo, kind of starting with you as you're now thinking about this, building a product that needs to bear all of these things in mind, but obviously drawing on experience with, with Google as well. Kind of how do you see that theme of, of ethics and privacy and security? Obviously GDPR now coming in gets us so far, that's a foundation. We don't need to talk anymore about GDPR. I think everyone's had enough of that. But you know, how do we go beyond that, right? Just because we can look at certain types of data or can track certain things, you know, should we? How do we govern that moving forward? I, I think there's two elements to it. One is that I think as, as an employer or as a software developer, um, there's what you're legally permitted to do, but there's a higher bar of what you ought to do. And my belief and our belief at our company is that you should never violate someone's expectation of privacy. And that expectation is going to vary by country, it's going to vary by location, by, by culture. Um, you can legally in most countries marry somebody's corporate information to external LinkedIn information or external data. I think that's wrong. You can legally, in any company, read all your employees' emails, and it turns out if you look for words with more emotional content, that is predictive of attrition. But I also think that's wrong, because as an employee, you don't expect somebody to be reading all your email or having a machine going through all your email to pick up on these signals. You shouldn't violate that expectation of privacy that people have. So I think that's on the employee side. I think more broadly, the tech industry is kind of at a crossroads. Um, they've had a lot of behavior, which basically is setting themselves up to get incredibly heavily regulated. And there's a lot of financial incentives in technology from VC industry and startups all the way up to large companies um, that give you tremendous incentive to like take people's data and, and, in my opinion, abuse it. And unless the industry corrects itself, they're gonna continue getting regulated increasingly heavily. And um, that's gonna have all kinds of other consequences. Yeah, excellent, thank you. And so Bernard, from, from your perspective, again, often taking that view beyond just, just HR, kind of any thoughts on, on the subject of, of privacy and ethics? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I, for, for me, the HR field is probably one of the most tricky fields because it is our personal data, our personal life, our personal careers. So companies need to get this fine balance right. and. I, I sometimes look at innovative fields like elite sports, for example. So I did a, a keynote at People World, at, 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 at Global People World, at the People World Conference, and what I try to do is pull out examples from elite sports and how they are using, literally, they are basically using HR data. 
So if you now look at what is happening in football, for example, where there are, what, where there are cam cameras watching every little moves, move of a football player generating 25 data points per second, this is all fed into a machine learning um, platform that will automatically code was this a successful pass, was this a tackle, it will analyze the gameplay and all of this is now given back in real time to the coaches. So those players are happy to have this information because a coach couldn't actually ever watch them individually all the time. And what I find in elite sport is that there's this relationship where it is good for the, for, for the club or the, the the, the people running it and it's good for individuals because they can then make sure that their training is rightly balanced, that they don't overtrain in certain areas, that they maximize their performance. And I feel in companies we don't have this balance at the moment. It feels more like this big brother approach that companies use data to find out who do I move on, who do I get rid of, instead of identifying who can I actually, how can we work together on this? And this partnership, I think, is really vital that we, that companies create this trusting relationship and this transparency of how they're using data and how this will benefit individuals. Yeah, and that's the key, right? It's putting individuals at the center of that, the employee, the candidate, whoever that mm. might be, right? So, Mel, earlier you, you made a point uh, which earlier which resonates with me, which is this situation that we are in a little bit at the moment where a lot of the technology that's coming out is very much uh, a single kind of use case at a time, right? Very much point solutions. And I used to joke uh, in the role that I had at Cisco that I was kind of creating this Frankenstein's monster because <laughs> I was plugging all these different things together, right? All these different parts. So how are you tackling that um, at Unilever? You know, given that you are implementing different tools and technologies, how are you trying to make sure that, to Bernard's point, that kind of employee at the center, that the employee experience is consistent, that these tools can talk to each other, or from a candidate perspective, you know, going from Pymetrics to Hireview, whatever it might be, that it's not a jarring experience for them? Yeah. So it's absolutely looking at it from an experience journey. So we have mapped out all the moments that matter in an experience life cycle and then think about how do we want to disrupt those moments that matter perhaps with a new tech stack or to be able to drive personalization, to be able to understand our employees and give them back more information to your point about themselves so that they can reskill themselves, thrive better in what they're um, doing, be able to make changes as they, as they need to. So I think that really looking at what's that moment that matters, what's that journey and then what are the right points I think with our um, digital selection process, part of the request for proposal, once we decided on the, and we had three providers in the end, um, we put them in a room for an hour. And I used to work in a, a startup, and I think I, it, that helps because you help them navigate a big beast when you've been in um, the small beast before. And I said to them, you know, at the end of the day, it's not about you, it's about the candidate. It needs to be a seamless experience that has a nice golden thread. They shouldn't feel that there's three different technologies behind it. It should feel like one. And actually, there's, there's more technologies because you have Workday, you have um, a number of other platforms. So they got in a room and then they came back and said, yes, we can kind of work to, together and we can do this um, for you. And we approached it as partners in disruption, not you're my supplier, you're my supplier, and you're my supplier, and we're coming together for that little piece. And I think that's absolutely key. But again, something that Laszlo said earlier, I think then the, the startups start playing in each other's spaces. And that's when it gets a little bit tricky because you, you've agreed kind of on, on one um, moment that matters in a certain way and then things are going to change. So I think you need to have that evolutionary conversation up front. So what happens if this happens? How are we going to tackle it? And how can you make sure that I still have the product that I need to serve my um, people well? Yeah, that's excellent. So Laszlo, I'd love to hear from your perspective in terms of building uh, you know, technology now, how are you thinking about that? You know, how are you considering the fact that everyone already has obviously legacy architecture that they need to deal with, that things need to may or may not integrate particularly well with, and then potentially they're looking at other little point solutions as well? Well, I think to, to build on Mel's point, one of the things that happens when you buy this kind of technology is, and, and this is often lost on companies until after you put it in, if you buy a company that does a hiring process or a company that does performance management or recognition, that company's process becomes your process. And one of the things that's really challenging about this space is, like for example, take performance management. No human being on the planet likes performance management. It's just not a natural thing, right? Like you don't go home to your spouse and have a performance management conversation every three or six months. You just don't do that. 
or I wouldn't recommend it because it won't end well. <laughs> Similarly in companies, people don't like the process because it's not a natural thing, but it tends to be pretty core to how you operate. And if you buy an off-the-shelf solution, whether it's some cool startup or an established company, their process is going to dictate how you actually run. So point one, and, and now these are kind of shifting a little to how we think about product design at Humu, but point one is you have to understand the context within which your system is going to operate, and it's going to be different from company to company. So for example, we work with, um, uh, and we're software, not consulting, but one of our clients is a, uh, like a, a quick serve restaurant, kind of you go up, stand behind the counter, and they make salads and fresh food and burritos and things in front of you. We have our people go and spend a couple days walking the line to make sure they understand the jobs. We make sure our product, when it's available for that population, is bilingual English and Spanish, because in this case it's in the US, most of the workers are Spanish speaking. You need to meet people where they are. We make sure that the, the way the product shows up feels organic within that company rather than like somebody from the outside saying, this is our solution for your problem. And by the way, we don't have the arrogance that we think our solution straight out of the box is exactly the right thing for everybody else. Because uh, every company's context is going to be different. So when you think about partnering with companies in the tech space, in the HR tech space, you really want to look for organizations where they're sensitive to how big an impact their product is going to have on your process. And you want to make sure that actually dovetails nicely, uh, number one. And number two, again, going back to Mel's point, you ideally want somebody or a cluster of things that are going to make sense five and 10 years from now. And that's really hard to predict in tech. Yeah. So it's either stepping back, if you're an HR practitioner or an executive or a business person, and going, here's how we think all the pieces are going to fit together, which it sounds like Unilever has done. Or it's finding a couple of partners who you think are actually going to be in it for the long haul and have more than just this little tiny box piece of a solution. Because even if it's fantastic for applicant screening, it's not going to manage referrals, perhaps, or it's not going to manage uh, feedback to candidates, or it's not going to manage onboarding. And then you're going to have to build and buy dozens of these systems and integrate them. And that won't work. That's great. And how are you building in some of the, some of the rest of the feedback that you're getting from the companies that you've been, been working with? Like, how much is that truly impacting your, your product roadmap? You know, how much are you shifting things around? Uh, well, quite a bit, because what we're finding is there's what we focus on is there's some general things that are true for all human beings that we try to lock into. So everybody wants meaning in their work, right? And if you can unlock that, people are happier, they stick around longer, they're more productive. Um, but that shows up differently in different professions. So if you're a home healthcare worker or a machinist or a checkout cashier at some retail chain or an executive or a lawyer or a doctor, how you find that connection to meaning actually varies a little bit. And you can still power all of it through AI and algorithms and kind of help make that connection stronger for people and foster that. But the way you show up in the technology, the way it actually presents itself, uh, ends up being a little bit different depending on the work environment. But the broad lines are sort of by industry sector, kind of vertically, and then horizontally by kind of job category. So that's where the customization happens. Excellent, excellent, thank you. All right, so shifting gears slightly, Bernard, I'm gonna to come to you. Um, one of the, the other kind of big topics that comes up around should we use AI and HR is this theme of bias. Are we either eliminating bias because we now have an algorithm and we can trust that algorithm, or are we actually creating an algorithm that's biased because of all the data um, that it's used and, and that it's historic data that it's learning from, um, and that's inherent uh, in that data. And, and so, Bernard, from your perspective, how should we tackle, tackle this issue as we kind of look at these problems? Yeah, I, I think, again, in HR, the potential bias in existing data is huge. So even though I, I feel that the HR function is, as you said before, hugely data rich, this is not always the data that you need. So what, again, from my experience, what happens is that sometimes you need to start fresh and collect new data. Because if, what, one of the examples I think about is a staff survey, for example. We all, that, we all know that people don't necessarily respond to those truthfully because they are fearful that this can be traced back to them. So there are other tools, and again, you, you touched on one of them. You could read people's emails and maybe derive ideas from not this. Not recommended. Which is, is, is not necessarily the best way to do it, but it would be much less biased, potentially. So. Th there's an interesting idea that, that we now have different ways of collecting data that might eliminate some of the biases that we have in existing data. So 
So I think we need both. We need to find ways of collecting data more bias free and we need to check what data we have and what potential biases are in it. But for me, this is a very big challenge for HR data. Yeah, excellent. And so, Lazo, from your perspective, how are you thinking about this uh, with the work that you're doing, or indeed, obviously, uh, at Google with some of the analysis that was done there? Yeah, um, it, it's a real issue. So, um, there's a bunch of issues with it. Uh, one is AI models tend to be black box, so you don't know how they're making decisions, uh, and they're highly susceptible to the training data. So, number two, because there's a lot of bias in existing HR systems and decision making, and not just racial and ethnic bias, but you know, you like people who like the same football team or what have you, right? That's a kind of bias too. There's also cognitive bias, like recency bias, halo and horns effect, things like that. All that shows up in the data, right? And uh, all that gets embedded in most AI systems. Um, the third issue with it is that um, a lot of the academic research that's been done uh, on people is done on college campuses. And so there's this beautiful research paper about how a lot of academic research is actually sort of the study of college sophomores. And the population is overwhelmingly white, male, and upper middle class. Because those are the people who are at colleges and who respond to surveys and end up being in these populations. So it's not representative of the real world at all. Um, what we had to do at Google, and what's beautiful now being post Google and having the whole world to play in instead of just one employee workforce, is you actually need to do two things. One is include as many people as possible, not just in your data set, but also in your design process, right? And, you know, it's sort of, it's not sufficient to just include people who are black, brown, Asian, Hispanic, everything, right? Um, you want people with different perspectives as well, but you absolutely need people who kind of come up in different ways because they'll help you build better systems and they'll detect things. Um, so for example, Google famously was in the press because in the Google Photos product, when you search for a gorilla, the faces of black people would come up. And while it is true that darker skins are harder to run photo detection software on because they reflect less light, it's also true that if you just put more bodies on this problem, more engineers working on it, you could absolutely solve it, right? But because there weren't enough people working on it, companies screwed up. So it's important to have a broad data set. It's important to have a diverse group of designers. And then the final thing is it's important and absolutely critical to, um, to actually rigorously scientifically test these systems. And I mean an academic quality level of rigor where you have A-B tests, where you have a control group and a sample population, where you replicate the studies, and all that needs to happen before you get on a stage and say, I have a solution that's going to improve hiring or improve retention or improve performance management or improve happiness. You have to do that because if you don't, you're actually doing harm and perpetuating a lot of bias that's already in the system. Excellent, that's great, thank you. So Mel, coming back to you and, and thinking again about some of this through the eyes of the, the HR profession, we've talked a lot about how we're thinking about using AI for HR problems, but what do we think needs to change within HR to help upskill the HR profession to actually help the rest of the business kind of manage the impact of AI on the workforce. You know, how much is, is HR involved, uh, you know, with that conversation at Unilever and, and what do you think the journey might be there for, for HR professionals? Yeah, I think it's a, a massive upskilling journey that ev everyone needs to be on. I think not only if you're buying or kind of implementing the, the tool, but if you're working with it, you need to kind of understand. I know kind of in the hiring process, even our recruiters, some of them were like, yeah, this, this AI will be fine. Let's just go with it. But I think they actually need to know what it's doing for all the points that you just um, explained. So number one is really upskilling yourself, understanding what is AI, what is it doing, and asking, as I said earlier, the kind of relevant questions. What are the 10 questions that I should be asking every time? and knowing kind of is that a good answer or is that a, a bad answer and getting yourself out to see lots of different stuff i think we, we tend to stay in our organization and kind of not bring the outside in so it's also about that outside in journey we sent the the top 40 of our um, hr staff on missions so we we chose um, six of the hot kind of hr or hot um, tech capitals in the world and we spent groups of 10 there and helped them see what's out there, what um, questions do they need to be asking, what are they seeing that's really got great science behind it, what's not, why are they thinking that? And I think that hugely opened their mind. They're asking far better questions now. They're kind of knowing what's a, a tool that has real science behind it versus something that might be a 
something cool for, for the moment. I think it's absolutely also in involving the rest of the business. So it's not just our job to be the change agent at the time of deployment, but it's having those people work on it. So those moments that matter, those employee journeys, exactly to Laszlo's point, it's having a diverse and inclusive group of people working on that, understanding that, and then being the advocates and change agents in the in the business. Yeah, absolutely, excellent. And then, Bernardo, is there anything you've seen around how other functions maybe have had kind of success with taking their learnings? Like, I know you look at marketing and the sport, you know, kind of how they can kind of take take broader view potentially of what's going on in their own industry and how that might help HR as they kind of upskill and, and help the business. Yeah, no, for me, every function at the moment has the same challenge that this technology is not coming into HR alone is coming into every single function and every different business unit that we now have. So you, you, you outlined this really well. I think it's really important that we need to upskill, we need to bring in some of the, the data science into HR. But for me, it's really important to have this technology function within HR that is slightly separate, that where we hire tech people rather than HR people and they work alongside um, and this, this has worked very well in other functions where I see this in finance and, and okay where I see this in finance and, and marketing as well yeah excellent I think that's absolutely critical and I think it's that HR and analytics team that we have that are all data scientists they're not HR people yeah. and to your point that's what makes a huge difference because they're helping upskill and we're helping them understand kind of the people problems in, in HR yeah, and Lazo, any thoughts from you on, on that as well around how HR needs to shift to support the business? Um, I think, yeah, I think when I, when I was at Google, we very deliberately had a philosophy, a three-thirds model of building the people function. Uh, One-thirds were people with HR backgrounds. One-thirds were people with uh, consulting backgrounds, typically top-tier strategy consulting firms because what they brought to the party was uh, business skill, change management skill, business acumen, and the HR people, of course, had uh, deep expertise in like the HR field. The third was, uh, and this was fully a third of the function, people with a deep analytics background, master's degrees, PhDs in physics, computer science, uh, uh, industrial and organizational psychology, and what they did was allow us to actually prove that all this stuff we were doing actually worked, that it wasn't just like three bullet points on a year-end review where we claim we're gonna get some kind of achievement and then move away from it. And uh, we have roughly that same split actually at Humu. It's roughly you know, a third engineering, a third people scientist, because we're a science first company, and a third kind of you know, recovering HR people. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. All right, so we are, we are running out of time. We've got about two or three minutes left. Um, we could keep talking for, forever. Uh, um, one final question then. Let's kind of look forward to the, to the future. Let's think five years from now. What, what do we think is going to be different for HR? How's AI going to have an impact when we look out five years? And Mel, let's kind of start with you from your perspective. Yeah, so I, I think we've been looking into the future a lot at Unilever and in, in the world of work and what that's going to, to look like for our people. I think you, it will be far more personalized than it is today, so that's the journey we're on. I don't think that AI is going to take over the world and that we're not going to need HR people. I, I think actually this is the age of humanity and, and I think Sarah, Sheryl Sandberg in her speech to MIT yesterday said it really brilliantly. These are, these are people that are gr the graduating class that has the best kind of tech savvy ever but it's how they build their teams and what they do with the technology that will make the difference. So I think it's about keeping in the human asking the great questions, checking what you buy has science behind it, and really thinking employee experience. And I think you're going to have a much more personalized journey. It's not going to be about jobs. It's going to be about experiences where you understand what skills are becoming um, irrelevant and you're moving into reskilling yourself and going to collect those experiences outside of your function. I think functions will be demolished and we'll all be working on different projects and experiences throughout our company and and I think that will happen in the next five five years for some of us definitely at Unilever we're already moving in that direction excellent I look forward to seeing that so Bernard from from your perspective okay so this is inspiring yeah and I, I, I agree this is some of the key trends that I'm seeing at the moment too um, uh, from a slightly more pessimistic point of view I, I think most companies are probably not on the same level as Unilever and I think over the next five years the change will be slightly disappointing 
in terms of pace and what was happening. What I expect to see is that lots of HR teams will implement some technology to help them. They will then realize that it's not quite doing what, it, what they were promised it would do. So actually over the next five years, I would see limited impact. However, over the next 10 to 15 years, I see a complete transformation where some of these technologies will become much more mature, where they will make, make a real impact. HR teams will become much, much more intelligent buyers of technology, much more intelligent implementers. And, and for me, the long term is definitely the focus on humanity, is on individuals, on making our lives happier and better. And I, I think if we use technology well, it can do all of this. It will definitely transform the HR function. I believe that lots of the, what, what HR is currently doing is administrative, is stuff that can be automated and people actually shouldn't be doing, machines should be doing. So there will be much less work, but hopefully more meaningful work. Excellent, excellent. And then, Lazo, last few, other than humor, obviously, hopefully being out of stealth mode in five years' time, uh, what else? What else do you see for us? Um, I think uh, we all have a choice to make, because you're going to see an increasing distance and spread between people who get to work in like amazing environments like this building, and innovative companies like Unilever, where I think I love everything Mel said and pray it comes true, and I think it's going to be true for a lot of companies. But for people who are unskilled, who don't have the right credentials and signals in the market, which are a total BS thing, but that's how jobs get filled these days. Uh, people who don't have access to the right resources, people who are working contract jobs or temp jobs or gig jobs, uh, those are incredibly vulnerable workforces. And if you think outside of sort of, you know, Western Europe, outside of the United States, there's entire countries where that disparity between people in sort of the higher tier jobs and, and the mass jobs is even more profound. I think you're gonna see increasing distance between the experience of work because at the end of the day, you can make money by building a business that treats people really well and gives them a lot of freedom. But in a lot of parts of the world, you can make a ton of money treating people badly and just turning through them again and again and again. And those of us who are in a position to make decisions about what products we use, what technology we use, the kind of environments we create, we're gonna be able to shape and maybe help some of these people get a better experience and, and lift them up if only by example, but hopefully by direct action and by setting a bar for what like ethical business looks like, how human beings should be treated, and the kind of opportunities people should be given, regardless of their background. Excellent. Thank you. So ending here on an incredibly positive note about the future of uh, AI and HR. Thank you all for coming. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation. We will be uh, heading to the Meet the Speakers room now if you're interested in doing that. And thank you again to my three panelists. You've been absolutely amazing. I could have kept going for another hour. I'm sure maybe you didn't want to, but I could have. So thank you all for coming, and thank you very much, panelists. <laughs>